Good morning, everyone. Today we are leaving our harvest host in San Ardo, California, and getting back on the road. We are driving up to San Francisco, where we will be spending some time touring the city. So let's turn on some road trip music and get going. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back to Safra Travels. I'm Randy. And I'm Diane. And this week we are in Castro Valley, which is just outside of San Francisco. It's one of the Bay Area uh, cities. And we're staying where? We're staying at the Anthony Cabot Regional Park. This, this park is very nice. It's up on the top of a hill. There's all these um, huge trees around us. It's like a state park. It is, it is. And right now, being their winter time, not all their camping is open. In fact, the um, loop we're staying in, there's only four sites, but it is full hookups. Yeah, there hasn't been more than 10 campers here at a time while we're here. So this is definitely their off season and some of the sites are closed. We've used this campground as a base camp to travel into San Francisco and tour the city. We've taken the BART train into the city and that's really been a great way to get in there because we didn't have to worry about parking the car. Um, we, it was relaxing to ride in. It was very convenient to the, to the campground in distance. You park your car and the station's right there and you hop on the train and go well, into the city. And the train runs right along the road so you wave at all the people stuck in traffic which is cool. Mm -hmm. Our first day into San Francisco we went to the Disney Family Museum. So let's show you some video of that. It's a little noisy, but we're doing something different this morning. We are taking the train into San Francisco. We figured that the cost of parking and driving down there and everything, and then the risk of having the truck broken into, it made more sense just to drive down the street to what's called the BART station and jump on the train and take that in. So that's what we're doing. Well, a little bit of an issue. We went one stop too many on our train ride, so we gotta go back one stop, and then we can get the bus to continue our ride to the Disney Family Museum. Now we're waiting for our bus. We were supposed to take this bus down to the transit center and then from there it's only about a four minute walk to the museum. So hopefully we can figure all this out. Well, we found our bus. Finally. Yeah, finally. Took a little bit, but uh, we're on our way now. Luckily we're still within our entry time, so we're good there. I will say that the train system is much easier to figure out than the buses. 
The Walt Disney Family Museum is located in the shadow of the Golden Gate Bridge at an area known as the Presidio. When we visited, we needed to purchase our tickets online and make a reservation for the day we attend. The museum is created by Walt's daughter, Diane Disney Miller, and owned and operated by the Walt Disney Family Foundation. The museum is not associated with the Walt Disney Company. It has been said that Diane Disney Miller wanted to locate the museum in San Francisco to give it separation from the Walt Disney Company in Southern California. The museum started with Walt's early life and growing up in the Midwest. At the age of 16, Walt changed the date on an affidavit verifying his birth date and joined the Army to fight. Upon turning home from World War II, Walt started working as an aminator and eventually created his own company called Laughagram. Laughagram Studios created a short called Alice in Wonderland based on the Alice of Wonderland story. Unfortunately, the studio was not very successful and ended up filing for bankruptcy. After which, Walt moved to Hollywood with his brother Roy and formed the Disney Brothers Studio. The Alice comedies were sold to Charles Mintz with a contract to sell additional episodes. During this time, Walt created Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Hoping to negotiate a larger fee for the Oswald shorts, Walt had traveled to New York City only to find out that Mintz owned the, the rights to the Oswald character and intended to produce the series himself. On the train back to California, Walt started sketching a new character based on a mouse. Walt wanted to name him Mortimer Mouse, but Lily and his wife thought that it was too pompous and suggested the name Mickey. So after the sensation of the movie The Jazz Singer, Walt used synchronized sound on Mickey's next short, Steamboat Willie. We'd have the fellows with the sound effects, we had the people with the voices, we had the orchestra going, and everybody had to synchronize. We that thing right on the bus. We had, a, we had a way of doing it, though. We had a little kind of a little beat that worked up and down. And, and uh, there were so many of those beats, you know, and they were all musicians working for me, so they could follow those beats. And when it came to a certain number of beats, they would go pop, or they would go bang, or they would go this, or they would pop one of these pop guns. With the success of Mickey and the other shorts, Walt wanted to create a feature-length cartoon. The studio began the four-year production of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. The film was released in December 1937, and by May 1939, its total gross was $6.5 million, making it one of the most successful sound films of to date. The film also took home an Academy Award for a Best Animated Feature at the 1938 Academy Award ceremony. With the success of Snow White, other feature-length cartoons followed Pinocchio, Fantasia, and Bambi. Although these films were considered classics today, they were not hits at, at the box office, and the Disney company lost money. In 1941, many of the Disney animators went on strike over a salary cut. The strike lasted five weeks, and Walt believed it was an attempt by the communist effort to gain influence in Hollywood. After the strike, a number of the animators that worked for Walt left the company to work for other corporations. This upset Walt because he felt that the people working for him were family, and the culture at the company never felt the same to Walt after the strike. During World War II, Disney formed the Walt Disney Training Films Unit to produce films for the military. Disney also produced shorts featuring Donald Duck cartoons to promote war bonds. In 1949, Walt and Lily moved to the Holmby Hills area of Los Angeles. And with the help of his friend, Ward Kimball, he created his backyard steam railroad. The name of the railroad was the Carrollwood Pacific Railroad. The working steam locomotive was built by the Disney studio engineers and Walt named it the Lily Bell after his wife. The trains were maintained in his backyard farm, which is now located in Griffin Park. Check up above where we visited Griffin Park and the Walt Disney Barn. 
in a previous video. During the early 50s, Walt would take his daughters to Griffin Park to ride the carousel. Walt would sit on a bench and think about creating a place where families could spend time together in a clean, unspoiled park, where both children and parents could have fun. Walt purchased an orange grove in Anaheim, California, 35 miles south of the Burbank studio and started work on what would become Disneyland. Walt wanted to create a separate organization for the Disney Park, and he formed a company called WED and sold shares to investors. One of the investors was ABC Television. The money from ABC was contingent on Walt Disney creating te television programs for the network. Walt, the ever the promoter, used the programs to promote the park. Walt Disney's Disneyland was a hit on ABC with a share of over 50% of the audience. In 1955, the grand opening was broadcast on ABC and seen by 70 million viewers. Walt wanted guests to enter Disneyland from Main Street, USA, based on his hometown of Marceline, Missouri. From there, visitors could travel to other lands, including Adventureland, Frontierland, Fantasyland, and Tomorrowland. Disneyland also contained a narrow gauge railroad that circled the park. Guests were able to ride the railroad and exit into the different lands. Perhaps the best known of Disney's creations were Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. The first of his talking mouse cartoons was called Steamboat Willie. It made its debut in October 1928. Mickey Mouse is a backstop. Disney went on to do feature-length pictures, beginning with Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. I was seven years old when I heard the news that Walt Disney died. And to this day, 54 years later, I can still remember exactly where I was, exactly what I was doing at that time. The world was shook by the loss of Walt Disney. But the company lived on and has grown and become what it is today. But you have to remember that it all started with a mouse. What did you think of the Disney Family Museum? I thought it was quite interesting. Um, it is a good size museum, so you do want to allow yourself, you know, three to four hours to look at everything. There's a lot to read, a lot to see, but it is well worth your time. It was, it was, it is really a great museum. It was one of the highlights that I wanted to do on this trip. I had kind of earmarked that if we get to, when we get to this area, that I wanted to do that, and I really enjoyed it. Okay. Our next trip into San Francisco, we again took the BART train, and this time we decided to hop on one of the tour buses. So we took the big bus hop on, hop off tour of San Francisco. And we'll show you a video of that. stopped at three, diff three different places. The first stop that we made and got off was to see um, the Painted Ladies. The Painted Ladies. And if you ever watch the series Full House or Fuller House, it is the row of houses across the street from the park that you see in the very beginning. We've jumped off the big bus and we're walking over. We're going to see if we can find the Painted Ladies, which are the colorful Victorian homes that is uh, symbolic of San Francisco. We're not sure where we're going. We're just kind of following everybody else. Hopefully somebody along here has got a map and they know where we're going and we get there too. Are you a fan of Full House? If you are, you recognize these houses behind us. They were always featured in the beginning of the TV show Full House. These are called the Painted Ladies of San Francisco and they're probably not as bright right now because of the direction of the sun. If we were here more in the afternoon, the sun would be shining right on them and they'd be right, really lit up. But 
these houses you are very photogenic and a lot of people come here to take the picture of them because you get these colorful houses in the foreground and the skyline of San Francisco behind you. And this is one of the stops if you take the tour bus around San Francisco. Yep, we hopped off here and get to look around a little bit and then we'll catch the bus and continue our tour. I don't think we were there at the best time of the day to take pictures of them because they were a little shadowed so they're not as bright looking as you see them in other pictures but it was it was fun to kind of wander through there then we got back on the bus and we took it across the bay bridge at, you know, which is kind of neat because you're on top of the bus you're in the open area so it was windy and cool but we got off at the viewing area for the bay bridge yeah, it was, that was nice. You could look out over the bay, see across to the city. It was, you know, that day it was cool. And like Randy said, we were on the big bus, but you can either sit below or on top, which is a much better place to take in all the sights. Right, it's an open roof bus and you can, it's easy to take pictures and such. And it was a lot of fun to ride up there. We were stopped here at the North uh, Bridge Vista view. Uh, and this is just, to the north side of the Golden Gate Bridge and it's a great spot to kind of stop and get off the bus and take a look around and get some good views of the not only the bridge but also the city which we did and the San Francisco Bay yeah and the bay you can see Alcatraz and the Bay Bridge and all that stuff right from here and all of San Francisco yep yep you can see the whole city uh, it's a fairly popular place there's quite a few people here checking things out on a Monday but uh, we're waiting now for the bus. It should be coming along pretty quick. Up oh, here it comes. It's just turning around the corner. So we'll be getting back on the bus, and then we're heading. We're going to get to the um, Fisherman's Wharf and uh, Piers next. So that'll be our next stop. After that, we got back on the bus, and we rode it to the Lombard Street exit or stop, I should say. And that one, unfortunately, wasn't as close to Lombard Street as we had thought. Or at least the part of Lombard Street that we wanted. Yeah, we were on Lombard Street, but we were probably a couple blocks from the curvy section of Lombard Street. So we had to hike up a big hill. Yeah, it was all, it was all uphill. Yep. But we did get to Lombard Street, and we got to observe the street and walk down it. Mm -hmm. Typical touristy stuff that, you know, it's fun to do. We made it to Lombard. Well, the top of Lombard Street. Lombard and Hyde, to be exact. Yep. The next section is the twisty section. Yep. So, we'll check that out. Behind me is Lombard Street, known as the crookedest street in the America. As you can see, it just zigzags back and forth. But what it does is it takes what would be over, a tw I think, a 25 degree grade and makes it to a 16 degree grade, so it's easily transversible in a vehicle. Now you can only go one way. You can only go down on Lombard Street. You can't go up. And you're not supposed to walk on the road, but it's not that busy today. So we're, we're cheating a little bit. But this is really cool. So we were told on the bus on the way here that they used to have on Easter Sunday a tricycle race down Lombard Street. What they would do is they'd all meet at the top of the hill and then when the cable car came across and stopped at the top of the hill and it blocked traffic, they would take their tricycles and ride down the hill and race down the hill and see who could get to the bottom first. It was totally unofficial. It wasn't sanctioned by the, by the city or anything like that, but it was just a fun thing that they used to do. If you go on YouTube, apparently you can find video of this, so we're going to have to go check that out. On a busy summer's day, Lombard Street could see up to 350 cars an hour down the street. They would be lined up at the top of the hill trying to get down the street. And obviously, only lasts a few seconds to drive all the way down. So, a lot of waiting probably for just a little bit of a ride. But I'm sure it's worth it. Yeah, it was fun to see. From there, we decided not to get back on the bus because we realized we weren't too far from Fisherman's Wharf. So, we walked down to Fisherman's Wharf from there, stopped and got some lunch and then walked along the shoreline from Fisher from Dwarf to Pier 41 and then over to Pier 39. We are in Fisherman's Wharf and we are just kind of walking around. We're not sure now where the, we catch the bus because we kind of got off at Lumbar Street and took a little shortcut and 
figured we'd catch it here at Fisherman's Wharf. So somewhere along here, there's gotta be a bus stop that we can catch. Here at Pier 39, we found some sea lions just hanging out here on a dock. <clears throat> Apparently, they're a regular tra attraction here in San Francisco. They are quite talkative. Auntie would love them. Well, we're walking along Pier 39, checking out all little shops and such. All right. There's restaurants and little shops. There's a merry-go-round. Yeah, right down there. Another attraction, I'm not sure what it is. Yeah, some kind of like shoot them up in the air type of ride. Yeah, so we're just taking a walk around and uh, checking out some of the shops. Yeah, it's kind of a neat little spot. Yeah, Pier 39 at Fisherman Wharf. Yep. It's really a neat place to see. You can take boat tours out of there. And um, yeah, it was, a, it was a fun afternoon. Then we got back on the bus and rode it back to our original point where we got off onto it, got off, and then took the train back home. On our third day into the city to go into Union Square, which is a shopping district. And so we'll show you some video of that now. Well, today we're back downtown San Francisco, and we decided to just make this a shopping trip just to kind of check out the stores and stuff. Don't know if we're buying anything. Just can't say speak for Diane, but she may find something. Yeah, we may find something. This actually, we've stepped inside a mall. We're not quite sure the name of the mall, but it is located in Union Square. So yep. we're just gonna take a look around, check out the stores, see what's different here in San Francisco than what we have at home, and maybe get a bite to eat. was like more of a tourist kind of just checked them out they are very high-end stores there's a uh, um, Nordstrom's Neiman Marcus Saks Fifth Avenue uh, I forget Louis Vuitton yeah um, Christian Dior uh, Harry Winston jewelry store so yeah a lot mostly high-end and you yeah, know. I think some of these stores you had to show them your bank account to get in. Right, or you need an appointment to go in. Yeah, right. but it was fun. I mean, there's there's stores that we've never been to um, that aren't in our area, um, except Macy's. Well, it was really a high-end Macy's. Yeah. So, you know, none of them were within our budget. 
So it was fun to walk around them and check that out. We grabbed some lunch while we were there. And then we uh, grabbed the train and came back. We also did walk up because it is oh, right Chinatown. next to Chinatown. Yeah. So we did walk up into Chinatown, but just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, we had ridden through on the bus tour part of Chinatown, but we did walk through the Chinatown gates and walked up a few of the streets and everything. Really inter real interesting contrast between the high-end stores and to when you get into Chinatown and it's all these uh, souvenir shops and, and... Yeah, but more um, Chinese architect art. Yeah, yeah. And, there were, and, the, and then the restaurants, the traditional Chinese restaurants, so there's a lot of them there. Good place if you want to get some dim sum or something like that for a meal. Right. And that, and that really was our week here. We did walk around this campground a little bit, and we, there's actually a lake that we walked around one day. Right, we did visit one of the local parks, and that was nice. Had a nice walkway. You can take your dogs. And, uh, yeah, there is boats you can rent, canoes, kayaks, and it looked like a, you know, a pretty nice lake that you could do that on. Yeah, yeah, we enjoyed that. And we enjoyed our stay here. Yeah, we did. We did. Yeah, this is a, this is a nice campground. Um, they are, sites are a little close together, um, but there's not a lot of them in an area. So, and some of the other sites are a little farther apart, but this loop is a little tight. Um, and their sites are a little small. We had to park the truck diagonally. We did get a ticket one day because we had the wheels on the gravel, not on the grass, but it wasn't on the pavement. So we got a ticket for that. Um, it, just a warning. It wasn't a ticket, it was a warning. It was a warning. Yeah. So we had to be careful how we parked uh, the, the truck while we are in this campsite. Um, other than that, it, it was nice. It was reasonable. County parks are typically a little cheaper. This one was $45 a night, but they did charge $2 per dog to for each of the dogs, so that added another $4 per night to our stay here. So $48, but it was full hookups. Right, right. So we would recommend this park again, and it would be a place we would come back if we were to stay in this area. Mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah, it was nice. It was a nice location, and it was close enough that you, you know, visit. You know, you could go shopping, or there was even movie theaters. Yep. Really much whatever you want to do. And like again, there is the BART system, the um, rapid transit, and that was very convenient to this park. Yeah, this worked as being a great uh, base camp to get into San Francisco. Well, we're leaving today, mm -hmm. and we're heading into Sonoma Valley. That will be our next video. But until then, what should you do to make sure you see that video? Subscribe to our channel, Is that for Travels. Hit the bell for notifications. We post videos on a weekly basis, and we want to make sure that you don't miss our next video. So until then. We're guys, we'll see you down the road. See you down the Take road. Take care. Bye. A lot of neat shops, and then you can go down by the water the water <laughs> oh my it's been a long day lots of walking and we're staying where at the robert cabot anthony cabot oh i'm sorry i don't know why i said robert <laughs> okay